I know she out here in these woods. And they're gonna bring you back to where you belong. Beyond the Road to Freedom, a News 4 special presentation. Join Rich Newberg and Milas Hairston on the Freedom Trail as we celebrate black history and progress in making that history come alive in Western New York. It's hard to imagine hiding in a place like this, a 10 by 12 foot chamber under a barn at Murphy Orchards in Niagara County. This hidden room of cemented stone with an arched brick ceiling is believed to have sheltered runaway slaves on the road to freedom to Canada. While places like this give us a tangible link to the past, a link we can touch and feel, the Underground Railroad was more about people than hiding places, more about courage than cowering in the shadow of the bounty hunter. In many cases, wintertime was the best time to travel. Nobody tells the story better than Western New Yorkers because the Freedom Trail cuts right through our neighborhoods and farms. The challenge now is to tell the story to a world hungry for freedom's lessons. How we are meeting that challenge is what our special report is all about. Tobacco. <laughs> Tobacco. You who got in tobacco for old lady? A spellbound group of tourists connects with the image of a woman once called the Moses of her people. Y'all can call me Harry Tubman. See, I'll be the leader of this here outfit. Going across this here swamp by and by. If I not say to duck, y'all got to duck. If I say to get low, you best to get low. I bring many people here. And I don't go, but where God ventures me forth to go. Her visitors from the 21st century will wind through the woods of Murphy Orchards, once the gateway to the McClue farm, where fugitive slaves found refuge. Run! Run to the river! Run! Led by Kevin Cottrell, who produced this moment in history as part of his plan to draw tourists to Western New York, these history thrill-seekers are about to come face to face with all that was mean and ugly on the road to freedom. Looky, looky, what we got here. Now, where do you folks think you're going? Which one of you is Harry Tubman? I'm looking for this woman. Which one of you is Harry Tubman? Speak up! I know she out here in these woods. I want you, Lord. To walk with me. But beyond the bounty hunter, they will see all that was beautiful and courageous on the road to freedom as they meet little Lizzie. I'm on this journey to freedom, and I hear up yonder. It's a big old house that's going to help me get some fresh clothes and maybe a little food as I continue on. By walking with these heroes of history, the aim is to touch people with powerful lessons that didn't come easy to runaway slaves. To put that little seed in their minds that they can be and do anything that they want to be if they just maintain their freedom in this world. It takes a village to raise a child. And freedom was the theme for these children who gave Governor George Pataki a special welcome to Buffalo when he signed a major commitment to keep the memory of the Underground Railroad alive. Today I am announcing that the state is putting one million dollars into that freedom trail to make sure that the Underground Railroad sites are preserved for the children of the 21st century and for future New Yorkers and Americans to see, experience and feel. This is the entrance to a secret room that is below the barn. At Murphy Orchards, tourists are able to see, experience, and feel what happened as escaping slaves moved toward freedom's door. That's why the National Park Service chose this site to inaugurate the country's new Network to Freedom program, which seeks to link underground railroad sites, programs, and facilities throughout the United States. People around the country are becoming aware of what Murphy Orchards has to offer, but it gives us a way to connect to the story that we don't often get just by reading a book or visiting a house. It just brings it alive. This is how I put food on my table. So one way or the other, I'm gonna get you. For Carol Murphy, 
All the attention from the National Park Service won't put food on her table. There's no money involved. But an inaugural announcement made from her farm means national promotion, and that can't hurt. And the fact that they made it from New York State is an honor. The fact that they made it from this little farm in New Fay, New York, is just incredible. And I praise the good Lord. And people are traveling to see this stuff, and they're willing to pay. And it's not so much commercializing the history, but they're going to pay anyway. So let's do it with integrity, and I think we do that. Integrity is the mortar that has kept the old Michigan Street Baptist Church viable since the first brick was laid in 1845. I'll give you it was built by African Americans in Buffalo who wanted their own place to worship. It became a safe haven for runaway slaves, and now there is a desperate attempt underway to keep the church from falling down. When the architects came in and they went into the attic and they looked at the raptors that had been there over 150 years and they saw pins missing and they saw deterioration, they saw cracks, they said, you got to do something right away, the roof's going to fall in. Well. Five years have passed and the roof is still up. It's a miracle the church is still standing, says Bishop William Henderson, and that the money has finally been found to keep it standing. I believe that God has ordained this place, and this is the reason why it has fallen down. I believe it's going to be revived. Architect Ted Lowney believes the church is one of Buffalo's greatest unadorned treasures. It's absolutely beautiful in its simplicity. The space is almost a... Um, a perfect cube, this, this worship space. It has uh, attempts at applied grandeur. It, its grandeur is in itself. Come on, come on, little one. That's right. The church's hidden treasure that these school children are about to discover is beyond a wall in the basement. A dark, damp, chilling glimpse into the past. A sanctuary within a sanctuary where escaping slaves crouched in darkness away from the gaze of bounty hunters. There was a false wall that you could move and push them in there and then move the wall. When it was safe, many moved on to cross the Niagara River to Canadian shores where they could live in freedom. I am the, Lord. the old Michigan Street Baptist Church, it seems, was meant to survive the ages and is still a house of worship to this very day a place, the bishop says, where the spirit is yet made free. Those who love this place and all it represents will not let it fade out of history. The end goal of this is to, of course, restore it both inside and out. And I think when that happens, you'll be thunderstruck to walk through those doors and to see this austere space and to realize, you know, the, the, uh, that this was, in a sense, the promised land for a lot of people. When they came here, they knew they were safe. Coming up, the man who would lead this church into the 20th century and the incredible legacy of the Reverend Dr. J. Edward Nash. It stands alone on a Buffalo street. Age has weathered its cover, but the pages inside the former home of the Reverend Dr. J. Edward Nash have stood the test of time and are giving people a new look at life at the turn of the 20th century. Reverend Nash was a leader in Buffalo's black community. He led the congregation at the Michigan Street Baptist Church for nearly six decades. He also played an important role in the early civil rights struggle. And what he left behind here in his home, much of it now cataloged and in boxes, is a virtual vault of valuable information. The Nash House has been designated by the city of Buffalo as a landmark. But for Reverend Nash's son, this was simply home. Because it seems as though I just uh, uh, was sleeping upstairs uh, last night. It doesn't seem like I've been out of the house that long. Jesse Nash left this house in 1953. He's excited his childhood home will be restored and turned into a black history research center. And he's proud people will learn about his father. My dad, first of all, was a physically huge man, a very large man. He wasn't so deeply steeped in the Bible that he couldn't see the so-called real-world applications that were required for his beliefs. 
It's a look into the mind of a man who helped shape not only the black community, but the city of Buffalo. Reverend Nash was noted for memorizing every sermon, and along with his wife, pushed the congregation at the Michigan Street Baptist Church to reach higher. But they were very eager activists, advocates for community and for our people. And it was in this home that I got my early orientation toward uh, what it means to be black in America, what it means to be an American. Historians say the documents found here are giving them insight into life in Buffalo's black community. Among the papers, every sermon given by Reverend Nash. There are also photographs and letters. Dr. Monroe Fordham is one of the people looking over the documents. He calls this a treasure chest of history. And these papers that he left tell so much about the community of Buffalo during the early 20th century. That collection represents, in my opinion, the most important collection of individual papers on any Afro-American in the last 10, 15 years. Historians are finding links to some of the most important African-Americans of that time, people who pushed the envelope of racial equality. African-Americans such as W.E.B. Du Bois, Adam Clayton Powell Sr., and Buffalo's Mary B. Talbert. Lillian Cerise Williams is the author of Strangers in the Land of Paradise. The book chronicles the creation of the African-American community in Buffalo in the early 1900s. Mary Burnett Talbert was perceived as the greatest leader in the city of Buffalo. Uh, Je the Reverend Jesse Nash was a prominent player. Mary B. Talbert was instrumental in forming the Niagara Movement in Buffalo. That organization eventually led to something much bigger. Frank Messiah is president of the Buffalo chapter of the NAACP. That group down in New York City came together with the Niagara, uh, lead, some of the leadership from the Niagara Movement, and in a sense created the uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Some historians believe Talbert did as much for women's rights as she did for civil rights. They say the documents in the Nash House are filling in some of the gaps in history. All these things are dated and they, they, were, they were preserved in a way that he must have known that somebody was going to find them and they, they would document his time period. Uh, you can just feel uh, the energy uh, from the, it, that was part of the community. Taking a closer look at the history of the community is William Senor. He's the executive director of the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society. This community was very much, uh, while in many ways separate from the white community of the day, it was, uh, it patterned itself uh, as a, a middle class neighborhood would pattern itself. The people who have seen the documents say this house, the Nash House, is an encyclopedia of history. It's going to be a, 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 a real boon for, for researchers for many, many years to come. Researchers will learn why Reverend Nash was so involved with the YMCA. The Y could offer, for example, courses that African-American young people could not take in other places. They will learn more about why African-American women like Mary B. Talbert were often in the forefront of civil rights activities. The woman could take advantage of some of the situations to provide information, to provide leadership, where if the male had done that, he would have been killed. People will learn because pages of history have been preserved. History that may become a tourist attraction with the creation of a black history heritage district. The Michigan Street Baptist Church, the Colored Musicians Club, and the Nash House will be the centerpieces of black history now being acknowledged and shared. Just ahead, how black history was viewed at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, a view that was protested by Buffalo's African American community. The great Pan American Exposition in Buffalo at the turn of the 20th century reflected the attitudes and trends of the times. The Midway, with its foreign villages, promised visitors curious and interesting evidence of civilization so different from our own. 
An exhibit called the Old Plantation was part of the Midway, complete with slave quarters. And by today's standards, it was described in awful terms. When uh, the darkies uh, were content and happy, and, uh, and you know, as slaves, and, the, and their children were described as pickaninnies. The language today is, is abhorrent, uh, and I'm sure that African Americans in 1901 also felt repulsed by it. Another carnival-type attraction you can actually see here from the gondola was the Darkest Africa exhibit. Touted as a collection of some 35 African native tribes showing villages in their primitive state, African culture was reduced to savages with spears and a great white hunter. The African tribal members were paid to appear bizarre and entertain the fairgoers. But they were supposed to do the wildest and most savage dances that they could possibly do. And these were major attractions. It was no coincidence that Darkest Africa was placed near the old plantation exhibit. To say, actually, on, on that slavery had done a great thing for these people. So here are these wild beasts that you have in the African village. But see how docile they are, and there's Laughing Ben, and he's having such a great time. And the Piccaninny children are playing. The tragedy is that 8 million people came to that fair. So they saw this, and they walked away with these images. Even before the exhibition opened, prominent African Americans in Buffalo knew about these exhibits, and they protested. They called for the inclusion of the so-called Negro exhibit, which had been featured in Paris. This exhibit highlighted the achievements of African Americans from emancipation to the turn of the century. The Negro exhibit did come to Buffalo, but had been forgotten over the last century until just recently. A huge Pan American Exposition scrapbook was discovered in the Buffalo and Erie County Main Library by rare book curator William Lose. Its pages were brittle. It's slowly breaking as I turn the leaves. He found a pamphlet for the Negro exhibit among the many items inside. Well, the pamphlet was devoted to the exhibit of material relating to the advancement of black Americans, and that it was uh, professionally printed. Unusually, it had a lot of advertising by local companies. The exhibit featured 300 works of great black Americans, including The Future of the American Negro by Booker T. Washington and The Underground Railroad by William Still. The first time a major exhibit of material relating to the black Americans had been exhibited in any northern state. The famed Reverend Nash of Buffalo was featured on the pamphlet cover, along with entrepreneur and politician James Ross, who promoted the exhibit. The local effort to bring this federally funded exhibit to Pan Am speaks volumes about Buffalo's black community at the time. The African American community in Buffalo at the turn of the century did have some power that we don't see um, in, in, in looking at the regular histories of Buffalo. Buffalo's African American community would again become incensed following the assassination of President William McKinley at the exhibition. The man who shot McKinley, Leon Cholgosh, was knocked to the ground by an African American, James Parker. Parker was then written out of history. McKinley had given a major address on trade policy the day before appearing at the Temple of Music for a reception. Sholgosh, believed to have been an anarchist, had hidden a revolver under a handkerchief in his hand. He shot the president twice. Parker, who was a waiter at the Pan Am, prevented Sholgosh from getting off a third shot. He knocked uh, Shoglitz down and, uh, and held him from shooting the third shot into uh, McKinley. While Parker never boasted about his actions, eyewitness accounts of his bravery were written up in newspapers in Buffalo and across the country. But Parker was not asked to testify at the trial of Sholgosh and was never identified during the trial as the citizen who risked his life to stop the assassin. He kind of exemplifies the black uh, African-American men that have been played a part in history all through the history of America that were on the periphery or even participated uh, strongly into the, the development of this country that was kind of uh, pushed aside. The Secret Service would take all the credit for seizing the gunmen. The Secret Service is, is dedicated to protecting the president's life, and when they don't do that, uh, it's uh, highly embarrassing for them, um, even today. When we come back, 
efforts in Western New York to make sure history is not forgotten. While I'm on this teacher journey, I want you, Lord, to walk with me. The road to freedom comes to life in Lewiston. For many people, the Marble Orchard is opening up a new chapter in history. We found that uh, the history of Lewiston is so rich, and there are so many wonderful characters uh, that we've learned about. Those characters are actually people who played pivotal roles in Lewiston for the Underground Railroad. The Marble Orchard is actually a nearby cemetery, the final resting place for people who are just now being recognized for their contributions. People like Josiah Tryon, an Underground Railroad conductor. Canada offered freedom to runaway slaves, which made Lewiston a natural destination. For our quiet little village, was the northernmost depot on the Underground Railroad. The Marble Orchard Plain Speaking is a production that takes people through the streets of Lewiston, but there's a difference. When people walk the streets, they're actually walking on the tracks of the Underground Railroad. Then I met Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, he pulled out a sailor and got the freedom. Frederick Douglass was the leading black abolitionist and one of the greatest speakers of his time. In our time, Pamela Gardner teaches history as the ghost of the Underground Railroad. The people that lived in this uh, town did a lot and contributed a lot to the Underground Railroad. The Marble Orchard could just go on and on and on because there's, there's so much history to tell. Historians say it's history that hasn't been told, that needs to be told. Two of the reasons why many people say reenactments are so important. Here at Buffalo's Broderick Park, this has been the setting for river crossing reenactments for nearly a decade. Because this is my last stop, or one of my last stops, before I cross that river uh -huh. into freedom, freedom. I'm going to cross that river into freedom. It's a missing piece in the lives of our children. For the pain and the hurt, names being taken away, why only one month again I say. Lillian Batchelor is the driving force behind the Buffalo Quarters Historical Society. Buffalo Quarters means Buffalo residents. For Batchelor, this annual river crossing reenactment is an opportunity to educate people, especially the young. It's history of this country and if you know partial of it, you're lacking. Because it's a history in which all of our young people should never want to see again under no circumstances. Baby's gone, father's no more, call someone master, and I'm the slave at the door. It's history that's having an impact on 11-year-old Latia Kitchen. She recites a poem she wrote when she was in third grade. She asks why February is the only month dedicated to the history of African Americans. My people worked hard, brick by brick, mile by mile. Why only one month? The commitment to history is growing. More lessons are being cultivated in this garden at Buffalo's Dorm Memorial AME Zion Church. The Harriet Tubman Memorial Garden is located along what is designated as Harriet Tubman Way. It's named after the woman who helped hundreds of slaves reach freedom. Harriet Tubman was known as the conductor of the Underground Railroad. When they come into our memorial garden, they can meditate. There will be literature here explaining who Harriet Tubman was. And it's just going to have a storytellers here. And the stories told will help fill in the pages of history many historians say need to be written. Everybody that comes through here, what is? They figured to be free. Freedom's lessons are now required it's learning in New York schools. Happens. I want them to say never, never again should we ever go back to that and that we must also reach out to help the least of God's children. Y'all understand? And there's even a move underway to honor the memory of Harriet Tubman with a state holiday bearing her name. People who cannot remember their past are condemned to repeat it. We're not going back that way. These are the shores that sheltered escaping slaves and nurtured the restless spirits of great civil rights leaders who would hold our country to its promise of liberty and justice for all. 
Those who are working to preserve our magnificent history know that beyond the road to freedom, there are still great lessons to be learned. For Milas Hairston, I'm Rich Newberg. Good night. Come on. Come on in. The road to freedom was a tedious journey. It was hard, but it, it, a lot of people made it through, and that's how we got to be where we are and who we are today. They didn't want to dwell back in slavery and look at that, but they wanted people to see that in the 40 years since uh, emancipation, African Americans have made tremendous strides. There was a dresser here, a table, a work table here, and a chair, chair here. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you very much. Professor Nash, who is um, recalling his memories here as a youth and sharing those with us, uh, so that we get an accurate portrayal. With the restoration of this home, we are spurring economic development um, to an underserved community using tourism as a tool. Mind you, that has never been done before in creating an attraction on the east side of Buffalo. Oh, my All our children, so there is so much they should know about this area and so much they should be proud of. But you've got to know the vision. Has God given you a vision?